We wanna hear the stories from the courses that you've taught. Whether in a lab, a classroom, kitchen, on Zoom, or in a shop. Drawing on your expertise, we'll ask the probing questions. What goes right and what goes wrong when teaching your favorite lesson? Hello, everybody, and welcome back to My Favorite Lesson, a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College. My name is Dr. Lauren Spring, and I am lucky enough to be here today with Dr. Rajul Singh, who is a professor of sustainable business management within the School of Business at Conestoga College. Hi, Rajul. Hi, Lauren. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. Oh, I'm so thrilled that you're here. I should say, full disclosure, Rajul and I have worked together sort of informally over the past year um, with some really exciting projects. And I am just so, so, so happy that you're here to share your passion for these themes and, and this particular lesson too. So thank you. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me here. Mm. So Rajul, why don't we start um, by a little bit of background? Maybe, you know, if you could let me and the listeners know how you ended up at Conestoga, what maybe your academic fields were in, it's, and uh, yeah, how you ended up here. Absolutely. I would be delighted to. Um, and the journey really starts about 20 years ago, uh, I'll say in a different part of the world, because uh, I have been teaching at Conestoga for about five years, but really started my journey as a management educator many, many years ago in India. Mm. And so I'll say that I uh, grew up in the northern part of India and uh, really trained myself as an environmental <laughs> professional and a researcher. So my journey began um, after I had completed my college. I got enrolled into an environmental program and really fell in love with the environment and the sustainability field. Um, and then I wanted to complete a PhD degree in mm -hmm. this area. So that's really where it started. Uh, I'll say midway through when I was doing my PhD dissertation, uh, started also teaching. Okay. So, so my first foray into teaching was at a very young age. I was still in my 20s. Wow. Some of the students I was teaching were, in fact, older than me <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or maybe sometimes equal in age. Uh, but it was kind of uh, just, just my first brush with teaching. And was this at the institution where you were doing your doctorate? Exactly. Okay. So, so as part of our dissertation, we were required to teach a few courses. Mm. And I was like, yes, I, I was really enjoying my time as an environmental researcher, uh, working with just the impacts of some of the pollutants on the animal body, etc. That was really fun to do. Uh, it was really interesting as a field. Uh, also, what was happening when I was growing up in India was uh, it was kind of a transition from uh, a slow-paced economy to to then kind of an opening up of the Indian economy. Okay. So a lot of uh, economic development and what we could see uh, and, and I could see as an environmental researcher was usually whatever uh, happens in different parts of the world is when there's economic and rapid economic development, mm -hmm. it usually co comes at the cost of sometimes social, uh, mm -hmm. I'll say, uh, underdevelopment, and, and sometimes at the cost of environmental problems. Ah, so, so, so really, that was kind of how the thinking was shaped, uh, but, but kind of then helped me made up my mind by the time I completed my dissertation. Uh, I thought, you know, what is going to be more impactful? Do I want to continue working in the research environment? Which, of course, you know, you, you conduct research, you come out with novel ideas, you share them as part of your publications and research papers. Mm -hmm that usually a lot of people don't read, right? <laughs> so yeah, so what's, <laughs> what's the impact on just the general public? Yeah. And then when I thought about teaching, which I, which I love doing, whatever little bit I did, I was like, that seems to be just more impactful. Mm. And direct, right? You direct. see the faces in front of you and Absolutely. You know, you're, you're seeing assignments and what kind of learning is, is percolating in these young minds. Right. And, and then being able to influence them. Mm -hmm. And when you're seeing what's happening around you, you feel, 
you know, maybe that is something that, that's, that's kind of, you know, what I'm more passionate about. And that probably is something that I would love to continue doing for the rest of my life. Mm. And that is where the, I, I shifted gears from a research environment to a teaching environment. Oh, wow. And so here I'm sitting in front of you <laughs> roughly around 20 years later, <laughs> uh, continuing to do what I love doing. But mm. yes, of course, the journey wasn't that straightforward. I started, in fact, Conestoga is the fifth educational institution that I'm teaching at. Oh, wow. okay. And I've taught in different environments at different levels. Uh, but mostly at the at the post secondary level uh, at at different institutions, um, so two different institutions, in fact three at uh, three in India and now two in Canada. Mm. My Canadian journey started about nine years ago, when we moved to Canada and. Uh, I didn't want to change my fields. Mm -hmm. And something that usually happens when you uh, come as, as a newcomer to, to a different country is you get a lot of, of course, you know, you're completely new. So, mm -hmm. so I had no network. I had nobody who could guide me as to what needs to be done. I was a seasoned educator. Yeah. And that's pretty much what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't want a second career. Yeah. I didn't want to, to do anything else. The class was my happy place. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to continue that professional journey. Uh, but it wasn't simple. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> how do you get started when you know no one? Yeah. And you don't really know, you know, what, 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 uh, what is in store for me? And, and how do I build a career from the scratch again? Uh, when I'm not so young in life. Yeah. Uh, but thankfully, even though I got a lot of uh, suggestions from people, think think of a different career, you know, teaching is not going to be easy. You may end up teaching part-time for, for maybe the rest of your life. Yeah. Uh, I decided it was worth giving a shot. And, and it was giving worth a try. And I wasn't sure whether I would succeed. But I was sure that, you know, I, I would be happy if I failed, but I at least have to. You've given it your all. Yes. And exactly. so which, which institution did you start working at first in Canada? Yeah, so I started with Seneca College. Okay. And I was fortunate that when I started looking for, you know, different institutions and and really it it is that you started, you know, build your resume first and send your resume to different places. Mm -hmm. And if you'll apply to maybe a hundred places, you'll you'll maybe hear from one. Yeah. Um, thankfully for me, I, I sent out resume and I contacted multiple people at different institutions, but Seneca was the first one that I heard back from. Mm. So I was fortunate that Seneca has a sustainable business management program okay. in their Newnham campus, ah. and that's where I got my break in. So this was almost within a year of, of landing in Canada. Wow. I, was able to transition to to the classroom again, and I was really happy, and I, I started teaching again. And was this full time right away at Seneca? Uh, no, this this was a part time position, okay. and um, I think it was really good that it was uh, that kind of uh, foot in the door that I needed. Mm -hmm. It was really good and and it, an interesting journey because coming from a different country where the teaching environment is different. Mm. Uh, you have to go through a phase of de-learning right. and then relearning as to how things work in a Canadian classroom. Can you share a bit more about that? What did it? What was that difference? What? How did the post-secondary setting look different in India versus at Seneca, for example? Yeah, and, and that's uh, hopefully that, that's a good uh, segue into just, just how I see myself as an educator, mm. really. It's, it's all about learning about ourselves and, and also sharing this journey with students becomes so interesting because mm -hmm. when students come from a different part of the world, it's, it's the same journey for them as well, you know, for, for so many international students that we have. Uh, so, yes, uh, how it was different was that um, in India, the system of education, particularly at the post-secondary level, is, is quite a formal environment, mm -hmm. right? It's more uh, centered around the content and, and knowledge sharing rather than really about building relationships in the classroom. Okay, right? and getting to know your students and <laughs> exactly. what's most interesting to them. Okay. Yes. So it is that, you know, yes, you, you're supposed to be a master of your craft, mm -hmm. but there's always this gap between uh, the, the teacher and the taught. Would it be fair to say there's like 
higher status, like that you, you're sort of there at the front of the room, this kind of sage on the stage. Exactly. Okay. Yes, that's, that's exactly what it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it, uh, it's completely different in a Canadian classroom. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and certainly at Conestoga, right, where we really yeah. have this constructivist approach. And Absolutely. really value peer-to-peer learning and, um, yeah, professors being well aware of why students, the why of learning, why they took this course, where they want to go in the future. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. So so, so that was one fundamental difference. Mm-hmm. So uh, needless to say, was it a smooth sail mm-hmm. <laughs> the first time I taught? No, absolutely not. Mm. And so essentially, you know, I, I realized that maybe things are not working the way that I'm used to, right? And I'll really have to work upon that building the relationship with the students in the classroom. Mm. So I think the first time around I taught, I, I really could fathom, you know, what needs to change, although I didn't know how to change it. Okay. And so typically something that, that I do at all institutions is just, just find out, you know, who, who can be of help. Mm. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who's been here a while and yeah. knows how this works. Yeah. So thankfully they, they had uh, a similar department to the teaching and learning department that we have at Conestoga, not, okay. not as big uh, and as extensive, <laughs> but, but there were supports help, uh, you know, that were available for faculty. And so there I went and, and I took all the workshops that were there that mm-hmm. helped me understand, you know, what are the expectations from an educator in a Canadian classroom? Mm. And I think that was really uh, helpful in then turning around, you know, before the next delivery, the next yeah. <laughs> time I taught things, I, I was successful in turning things around. And, and that's where I felt that there was so much of then reframing, reshaping my education tools uh, at, at a different level. Um, and, and that shaped me as, as the educator that I am today. So, so it was a long journey, but I'll say it was, it was helpful. And would it be fair to say that that component of the journey was like a mix of exciting and uncomfortable? Or were you sort of right away saying, okay, this is the way I'm going to do things now? Or, or was there some hesitation or reluctance to, to change what you were so used to and had worked for you? Absolutely. And I can definitely, you know, agree that it wasn't easy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was not an easy journey, although today I can smile and talk about it. <laughs> Looking <It's>, back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it wasn't easy uh, to start off with. But then again, um, I feel as an educator, you have to constantly change and mold, right? Yeah. Be- because the pace of change that we have around us is so, uh, I'll say, so fast mm-hmm. and so intense constantly that you constantly have to reinvent yourself. You yeah. have to adjust to the changing needs of the learners. And so for me, it was just about, you know, finding where what are the tools available for me to change and support me in, on that journey. And, and so once I knew what supports the college had, uh, it just became easy to, to utilize them and then to change my delivery uh, from, from there onwards. Are there specific things that you value about the, the approach to learning here in, in the college that, um, yeah, maybe you were outside of your realm of knowledge before coming here that now now you think are, yeah, are really key to who you are and your teaching philosophy? Absolutely. And I, I feel that that the beauty of a Canadian classroom is, is really about, and, and particularly a college classroom, is really that applied learning, the hands-on approaches to learning, which mm-hmm. is something that, that I had, say, in, in the first part of my career I wasn't really familiar with. But then when I started teaching in Canada, I just understood, you know, the nuances of of these applied aspects of teaching and learning. Mm. Um, And and they were really helpful because I see how much they are valuable for students. Mm. Because I see a growing number of students who are coming to us who already have a degree from from a wonderful university, top of the class. What they're lacking usually is they, they can't, can't get into a job because they don't have that applied learning aspect yeah. as, as part of their learning, which they then get in, in a Conestoga classroom. And they are ready to get into the job market within a few months or, or a, just a year's time. So I think that's, that's really valuable. And, and being a part of the student's journey that way, I, I feel, is, is something that I'm really passionate about. Yeah, laying down those little stepping stones. And I mean, it, it takes me back to something you said a little bit earlier in the conversation, too, about 
you know, when you were in that more academic research world, how sometimes, you know, you'd, you'd engage in projects for years and years and write brilliant publications, I'm sure. But then, yeah, there's a select few also within these academic worlds that would read them and appreciate them. Um, and, you know, that realization of, wait a second, like, the, <laughs> I want to I want to speak to the broader public. And, and now I find, especially in, in programs that you're teaching in, in responsible business management and sustainable development style programs, um, the practicality matters a lot, right? If, if it were just to yes. stay in that realm of theory, and, you know, there's a select few, maybe attending these conferences that are engaging in this, albeit very rich material, right. r- real change isn't going to happen. Um, and so I'm curious to hear from you a little bit about these programs, the one at Seneca and then, you know, very similar, it sounds like, a uh, program here at Conestoga and how they came about there within the School of Business. So what, why do you think we need to talk about sustainability in, within the School of Business? Absolutely. And, and that's something that uh, I've been fortunate to take a look at both as an educator, but also as a sustainability practitioner. Mm. So the program that I teach in in the School of Business, I started teaching with the Sustainable Business Management Program, which is a specialized one-year graduate cert- postgraduate certificate program for helping students understand the intricate details of how sustainability works in the business environment. Okay. Right? Yeah. And so the common theme of understanding is that sustainability is somehow counterproductive for businesses, Mm. right? So if you want to be a sustainable business, you'll probably have to spend more money to be sustainable. And, you know, you're you're going to be compromising with your bottom line or your profitability in some way, right? Yeah. And the common narrative is that, that, you know, people are motivated by by profit and, and, you know, responsible to investors or whoever it may be. Exactly. It's a shift in paradigm, essentially. Yes. And so what the program does really beautifully is we help then with with understanding, you know, why it makes sense for businesses to be sustainable in the first place. Mm. And then how can businesses maximize their profitability, not just focusing on shareholder value, but then stakeholder value. And uh, students are trained to use multiple tools And uh, we utilize that applied learning uh, approach to ensure that we are equipping students with the right skills. And when I say skills, we really want to give them skills of, you know, thinking about systems thinking, Mm -hmm. thinking about critical ways of solving problems that the industry is constantly grappling with, Mm -hmm. thinking about just all the kind of global changes that we are seeing in our climate and, and the global challenges we have around climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. Mm. And then still making sure that we, we're bringing everything back to that business profitability and long-term value, not just for businesses, but for society and for the environment as well. So yeah. it's, it's really kind of shaping, uh, I'll say, individual sustainability professionals, shaping their mindsets, mm. which as you can understand and appreciate, you know, one year is not a very long time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So to change the ways of thinking and also to then provide the required skills in that short period of time needs a lot of intense work right. from both the educator perspective, but also the student perspective. Yeah. But uh, but we, we do it successfully. Mm-hmm. And our students, I'm, I'm really proud to say that students successfully learn. They polish their skills and they are ready to, to get into jobs in, in different industries whether it's working for government agency, whether for businesses, whether for nonprofit organizations, they successfully take their skills into the, the real world where the, these skills are more and more needed because the industry is constantly grappling with a shortage of, of people who can help solve problems around sustainability and business yeah. sustainability as well. Well, and that's what's so fascinating about this too is because what I'm hearing from you is this is not – you know, a business school that's teaching the status quo and, you know, this is how things operate and always will be and always have. It's almost like there's no blueprint. Yes. So this kind of critical and creative thinking and, and awareness of sustainable development goals that have been set forward by the UN and uh, teaching students how to think differently and, and maybe how to be brave when they enter into these companies. Um, what sort of, you mentioned these kind of practical tools or skills that then they they walk away from this program with and bring to the workforce. What are some of those things that, that they have? 
Yeah, absolutely. So so it is a wide array of of tools that are uh, sometimes using specific technology, okay. right? Sometimes it is about using a particular platform that can help mm-hmm. you measure and manage uh, different aspects of business sustainability. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it is adapting these frameworks like like the sustainable development goals mm-hmm. that are a common framework that was presented to the world in 2015 as part of the Paris Agreement. Mm-hmm. And so these 17 goals that otherwise appear to be really simple to do are really difficult and challenging to achieve. We had a 15-year long timeline, and so we have until 2030 to achieve those goals. Not a single. How are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> I fear the answer. <laughs> yeah, and and we're not doing enough. Yeah. And so it it came out as a global roadmap that uh, need to be taken at at the global level. So so all countries of the world under the United Nations needed to have concrete plans of action Mm -hmm. for progressing. Uh, Not many people across the world understand it. So we help our students understand, you know, how do you make sense of something as broad as the sustainable development goals? And then how do you adapt it to the local scenario and then to the business scenario? Yeah. And um, then how do you actually get hands on so how do you integrate sustainability in, say, the marketing function of your business? How do you integrate it into the operations of your business? How do you integrate it into human resources, into finance? Mm. You know, so, so those are all aspects of sustainability that, that we discuss. And then we utilize the appropriate tools for, for each of these functional areas of business. So it's really hands-on. But the, the end goal is then how do we actually help use everything that we are doing in the classroom to transform societies and transform the environment around us because because yeah. that is the need of the hour why are we teaching sustainability in business because we want to see some transformational changes mm. that will help us counter these global problems around climate change global warming just just the unsustainable use and and uh, exhaustion of resources that we are seeing loss of biodiversity mm. so just thinking about the state of the planet and how do we ensure that our business practices are not moving in an opposite direction but kind of supplementing a transition to a sustainable world is the entire goal of the sustainable business management program well, and it's really beautiful to hear you describe it that way, too, because, you know, folks who are maybe unfamiliar with the 17 <clears throat> Sustainable Development Goals, you can, I'll link, I'll link in the show notes to, <laughs> to the UN website, but um, they're pretty all-encompassing, right? I think oftentimes people hear the word sustainability and might think about, yeah, climate change or clean water, et cetera, but they're, you know, within these 17 goals, there's also gender equality and there's also infrastructure and more economic related ones. And so all of these things really are intertwined. And so I love to hear you describe, you know, our business leaders, business managers of the future, taking all this into account. And it's not just about, you know, what does the company website say or what does it look like? What's the design? What are what's our mission? But also, OK, how do we treat employees? What um, what are our hiring practices? What you know, if we're producing a product, yeah. what kind of research have we done to make sure that that's sustainable? There's there's so many aspects to it. Absolutely. And um, I can just uh, transition to to what I've seen in the industry over yeah, the last sure. two decades, which is the time that I've spent. Uh, not just teaching about sustainability, but I was fortunate that within all the institutions that I was teaching, I had really good opportunities, just like I'm doing here at Conestoga. I work on an initiative called PRIME, uh, which which stands for the Principles for Responsible Management Education, and it is a United Nations-backed framework for management institutions worldwide, Mm. because the goal was, when it was presented to the world in 2007, that we are training a lot of management professionals. We're training business managers. We don't seem to be giving them the right values that help them create long-term value for society, for environment. We're only training them to think about business profitability for a few people, make a few people rich. Businesses become rich, but then that's usually happening at the cost of society and environment. And it's so short-sighted, right? Exactly, yes. So so short-term thinking versus long-term value creation is Mm -hmm. the value proposition of Prime. Um, And... uh, Something similar that I have been doing at other institutions before Conestoga was just thinking of how can we integrate sustainability into these institutions, which are really big 
institutions. They they affect the lives of thousands of students, thousands of employees. And so what can we do within the institutions Mm -hmm. to make these institutions more sustainable? And so kind of that journey has been, so I've been dabbling both in sustainability practice and and then also been teaching simultaneously. But what I've seen in the last 20 years is 20 years ago, businesses would be doing anything to create profit Mm. and uh, they could create any amount of greenhouse gas emissions, create as much pollution, create as many problems for society. If the bottom line looked okay, that was success, right? And as long as they said, oh, here are a few things that we do for corporate social responsibility, like Mm. we donate money to a charity, we, we provide certain funds to a hospital, we go out and grow a few trees, it used to be okay. Um, And today where I sit at uh, is uh, I'm I'm happy to see that today, if as a business you say, oh, I'm doing a few things for corporate social responsibility, nobody even knows that word anymore, right? Mm. It's true, yeah. It was a buzzword for a while. (laughs) The requirement is... That is just greenwashing. You need to be integrating sustainability into your day-to-day activities. Everything that you do as a business, that is creating an impact, right? So so there is an impact of every single business activity. Now, how do you measure that impact? Is that positive, negative? What are you doing to counter your negative impacts of business? Mm -hmm. And that's really the change that I have seen over the last 20 years. And I'm happy to see how, how this modification is happening. Is it enough is the big question. No, it's not. We need to continue doing more. And I think we need to shape um, our our young people. So our students are are signs of hope, I'll say, who who are asking more questions. And they are questioning everything that that they're they're, they're really, who they think are are business leaders. They're even questioning, you know, you Mm -hmm. saying something on your website, but then when I go and, you know, take an (laughs) in-depth look at certain uh, business practices and your operations and stuff, I feel that there's a lot of greenwashing going on. So having the bravery to do that, right? And and also the knowledge that, wait, there's a template. I've seen maybe in my studies or in placements, like that there are alternatives that are taking all of these things into account. And Yes. So although there are frameworks like the Sustainable Development Goals, they're really broad, right? Yeah. So it is a challenge as to how do you interpret something as broad as these 17 goals that start off with something like no poverty or zero hunger that that you as an individual may not think as a business professional, you know, what can I really do about it? Yeah. What we do is we help student, students understand, you know, how that translates into, say, if you have a restaurant business, uh-huh. right? Or if you're working in the food industry, then how would you translate that broad goal mm. of zero hunger into something uh, that's local impact that you can positively impact through your business practices? Yeah. And, and and that's then how we translate these broader goals into some tangible uh, you know, targets that you create as a business and then some positive impact that you would like to showcase on the ground. And you said something. I just want to repeat this because um, make sure I got it right. So this idea of like short-term thinking versus long-term value creation, that's the, yes. that's the big yes. shift that's happening here. Um, and you had said something too earlier about not just thinking of state of shareholders, but stakeholders. What does exactly. that mean? What is that difference for you? Or what do you, how would you explain that to students? Yeah, so... so Typical business mindset was that you need to maximize, you know, monetary value creation for your shareholders, right? Because mm-hmm. they are the, the supreme people who will define how your business runs mm-hmm. and how long your your business remains, uh, it remains in business, yeah. right? Uh, but how that has shifted, and, and I'm, I'm fortunate that there's, there's such a shift that's happened over the last two decades. In fact, this field has has become really a field in these last two decades uh, as, as a strong field uh, that could even you know, survive a global pandemic, yeah. <laughs> as you would say, right? right? And we were all really worried about, you know, what, what happens, uh, you know, after the pandemic is over? Will, will sustainability be alive as a field or, or is it just going to crumble because there are other pressing uh, areas like healthcare that are going to really take center stage? Yeah. But then what came out of it was we still need to think about good health and well-being, right? Well, and and, and the interconnectedness of it all yes. and the globe, like these these are global goals and just 
they could apply to every single city in every country in the exactly. world. And then certain countries obviously, um, you know, have a more dire need or, or it's much more pressing right. in, in a larger scale, I'd say. So I think what's happening right now is that businesses are now seeing themselves not as value creators for just shareholders, mm -hmm. but value creators for, for the society, yeah. right? Not just making profitability for yourself happen, but also thinking about what value are you giving to, to the broader society that you operate in. So when I say stakeholders, we mean, yes, the society and the communities for which you are creating products and services as a business. Yeah. We're thinking about the different uh, non-profit organizations that operate in your area or, or, and are constantly scrutinizing you, right? right yeah. How do you make them partners in your journey on, yeah. on value creation? And see those how do you, yes, how do you work with, with government agencies, right? In tandem and not, not, not opposite to each other. Yeah. And then how do you make sure that you are serving the needs of your customers um, and, and thinking of consumers, right? Yeah. Uh, and making sure that they give you the permission to sustain yourself as a business in the long term, right? Well, and I think that's a perfect segue. I want to make sure we have time to get to the specifics of this lesson, but that word sustainability. Like if you were to ask any yes. business manager, probably, do you want your company, your organization to be sustainable? I'm sure they'd say yes, even with the definition yes. of like, yes, I want it to last over years and decades and centuries maybe. Um, and that's part of the lesson that you brought in, right, is having students yes. define what sustainability Sustain means to them. So why don't we why don't we segue into talking about this this particular lesson? Exactly. Yeah. So uh, this particular lesson that I would like to talk you, to you about really kind of brings to center stage something that is usually missing out of the sustainability discussions, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, usually what happens is yes, we we're, we're all very quick to lay the blame on businesses very yeah. quickly about you know yes businesses are responsible for making the world more unsustainable, and that is true to a great extent, mm. right? But the scale of the challenges that we have around us are so, I'll say, big yeah. and and so intense. And intertwined. Intertwined, and we don't have too much time to solve all these crises that are unfolding around us. Yeah. So can we just leave it up to businesses, or can we only tell the, biz, uh, the governments that it's their responsibility to think of sustainability and the sustainable mm -hmm. development goals? What is the role of the individual? Right. And usually that's something that gets lost in all these conversations. So it's kind of stakeholder <laughs> responsibility. Yes. Just as you were saying, you know, if, if we're broadening from shareholders to stakeholders, we're all stakeholders when a lot of the <laughs> products we consume, companies that we, we support, you know, intentionally or out of necessity, it seems sometimes. Exactly. And so the goal was to how do we bring that responsibility to the individual level? Because okay. when I start talking about the sustainable development goals, usually, yeah. you know, the common perception and, and usually what happens is, you know, these goals are too broad. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to associate with them. Businesses will never be able to, you know, integrate or align their business practices. Um, and it usually leads to to despair. Mm -hmm. And and there are words like, uh, I'll say, Yes, you, you don't want people to be uh, feeling hopeless. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so so you don't want to be talking about sustainability where you are leading people to the situation of the real world is in such a situation of despair that there's no hope. Right. And so the goal of the lesson is to to build hope through some tangible actions. <laughs> like and <it>. so <laughs> how do you how do you build hope? Well, to me, I will be hopeful if I know that I'm doing my best to solve a particular problem, okay, right? Yeah. And, and that usually then is something that for what I apply to myself, I also then you know, think about students that way, yeah. right? Where do you start feeling hopeless about all these crises that you have around you and, and the unsustainable world that we see around us? Well, what can we start doing about it? And that's, that's, that's the first, I'll say, step towards, well, let's think about what we can do about it. Okay. And so this lesson really starts with uh, this aspect of, Let's start thinking of what can we start doing for making progress towards these different aspects of sustainability and climate action around us. And so students are encouraged um, to yeah, reflect, you know, I, I, you're saying it's indivi individually, themselves as individuals, so I guess it's an individual assignment where um, they're 
considering, okay, my daily actions, is it about what they can do moment to moment in their living space or within their school or kind of more in the workplace or could, is it open-ended enough that they could take it in any direction? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd love to go through uh, just the different aspects of it. Sure. And one of the challenges of teaching in, in the sustainability field is you have the whole universe in front of you. So how do you, you know, define the scope of your teaching? Yeah. <laughs> so So it's really important to focus on the specific areas because you want the learning to be tangible and you want students to be taking uh, from the lesson. So the lesson I'm talking about uh, today is it's called Sustainability and the Self. Okay. That's the title of the lesson. Yes. This is part of the Sustainable Business Management Program, which is a one-year program, but we teach this course as kind of a foundation program right at the beginning. Okay. So students are new. They come to us from all different parts of the world. We have a good mix of domestic and international students. Who are these students? They come from all different fields. Okay. So we have engineers, we have architects, we have agriculturists, wow. we have, of course, environment and sustainability experts. Mm. They come to us from all different fields and they come with varying levels of understanding of sustainability and business sustainability. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so some of them are in for a surprise when they sit down in their first class. And then, exactly. Wow. And so then, then kind of a challenge and both an opportunity is to... How do we bring them to a level playing field? Yeah. Right. So they all need kind of some, I'll say some common platform. Mm -hmm. And for me, something that that I started doing a couple of years ago was started to build templates, right? Because I have students who understand things at the expert level and ones who are absolutely at the beginner level. Right. There needs to be some common understanding so that everyone's taking what's being shared in the class. So so I started creating a few templates, and this lesson that I'm talking about is, is taking care of a template that helps students build a sustainability and climate action plan for themselves as an individual. Okay. So we started off as, and, and something that I did, and this happened before COVID, because necessity is the mother of invention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when teaching, yeah, right, you can talk of sustainability in the classroom. It's it's a different world altogether, and it's a very immersive experience. Yeah. Because part of my teaching is definitely focused on on all three learning domains. So I want the the mm -hmm. cognitive, the mm -hmm. affector, and the psychomotor. Yeah. And then how do you do that in a virtual world? <laughs> right. Yeah. Is really challenging. But something that that came out of it uh, as a challenge was that a few years ago I was doing an E3 workshop and E3 didn't happen that year. So, mm -hmm. so for people who are new to the college, E3 stands for the Employee for Excellence in Education. It happens during the spring term where all uh, the college community comes together and we share ideas and it's a wonderful, uh, I, I'll say, platform. It's so for, fun and people do workshops yes. on all sorts of things, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, some stuff that where they're experts in their field and they're sharing yes. this knowledge. Other times it's, you know, a cool place they traveled and they want to share travel pictures. Right. And yeah, it's a really great event. So, so 2020, the event was canceled because of COVID um, and there was a smaller format called Wellness at Conestoga. Mm. And so I wanted to do a workshop and, and they were only selecting a few people and, and the team reached out to me that we would like to have a workshop on sustainability, but it's virtual. Would you like to do it? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I would love to do it in a classroom, but now I need to, you know, change gears and yeah. think of, you know, what will work in, in, in the virtual environment. Uh, and so I started thinking of, you know, how do I create that immersive experience in, in the virtual environment through Zoom? Uh, and I came out with this idea of maybe create a sticker book, you know, because mm -hmm. I wanted to deal with the sustainable development goals, uh, a few of the prime principles, uh -huh. uh, something called good life goals, which are a simpler version and, and a funnier version of the sustainable development goals. Okay. And so I was like... Let me create a kind of a sticker book activity. You know, can you think of a child who didn't like to play with stickers? I loved it. <laughs> I, I still have mine, actually. <laughs> so, so I don't know how, but I came out with this idea that let me uh. create a template book and then kind of sticker book. Mm -hmm. And so people have to move icons because the SDGs have really colorful icons. Yep. The prime principles have their own icons. Yeah, they do the, look like little stickers already. <laughs> the, the good life goals have their own icons. 
And so I, I started creating these steps. So, so I created a five-step process where an individual would start with their own personal definition of sustainability. You know, okay. and and everyone's perception around sustainability, sustainable development is different. Yeah. The most common definition, of course, was given by the Brundtland Commission in 1987, which says that development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising with the needs of future generations for meeting their needs yeah. is sustainable development. But there can be different definitions of sustainability yeah. uh, from the business perspective, from the social perspective, from environmental perspective. So they, they can be different definitions. So I want students to develop their own value proposition of sustainability. So, so start thinking, start start engaging with the definition of sustainability. And it's so rich, step. right? Because even within that, my mind is reeling like, okay, but what are needs really? And yes. sometimes businesses are responsible right. for making us think we need something that is maybe not a, a fundamental need. So yeah, I could see how even just that, that, that component of coming up with your own definition could be really valuable. Exactly. And and the simplest definition is how can you learn how to do more with less? Yeah. Right? And yeah. some students really resonate with that one. So, so I give them options that, uh, you know, there are multiple definitions. You can bring a definition from the sticker book or you can create your own. Okay. Then we move on to the next step, which is let's see the sustainable development goals. So they've already been introduced to, to the SDGs okay. and they have to think about their professional understanding, you know, mm. which SDGs can integrate with, they say, their, their work life. Right. Uh, whatever they are doing in their field, you know, how can they integrate a few SDGs there? And then what actions they can take, right? So it's all action-oriented as well. And that's sort of nice because the 17, while all very important and certainly right. intertwined, that can be overwhelming. And like yes. you're saying, if the, one of the purposes of this assignment is to give students some hope and make them feel like their actions matter. Yes. I can see why narrowing down to one or two or, or a handful um, that, you know, are, are most relevant to them would make sense. Exactly. And then I introduce the prime principles. Mm -hmm. And so, so these are, again, some things that they have heard of because the School of Business is really active in this area. But we want them to understand, you know, which do you think are more valuable? Mm -hmm. So out of the six that we have, which focus on purpose, values, methods, research, partnerships and dialogues, they then, you know, just just... Uh, immerse themselves in those definitions and understand, mm -hmm. you know, which really is making sense for, for say, Conestoga College, right? And and I say, yeah. okay, let's let's think of Conestoga College. Which ones really make sense? Do you think? Uh, from from your perspective as a student, so so they they engage with this part of. The and I step. would imagine, <laughs> you know, it must be really rich to read what they come up with because. There's no one right answer, right? Like exactly. I'm sure a student could take any of those yes. and come up with something pretty compelling. And some will choose a lot. A few mm. will choose just a few. But then it's it's really interesting that students often come back and tell me they did this entire activity a couple of times, mm. right? They did it at the <laughs> beginning of the term and then they the did it at the I chose end. wasn't enough. <laughs> yes, and, and then they, they come and share that, you know, their understanding changed through the course of the term and, and now they think differently. Huh. So so that's uh, the the third step and then the next one is about the good life goals mm. so good life goals are kind of lifestyle related actions that you can take in relation to the sustainable development goals so so a simple and i'll say a playful way to look at the sdgs and so they're supposed to pick a few of those mm. for their personal uh, life and the final step is that there is something called an ecological footprint calculator, oh, right, yes. which helps you take a look at, you know, what kind of food do you eat? You know, what transportation methods do you use? How are your energy needs being met? And and how much of the Earth's resources are you using? Right. right? Yeah. So the footprint calculator asks you certain questions about your lifestyle and gives you an output in terms of how many Earths do you need to sustain your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And it's really eye-opening for students because some of them will come out, I need five Earths to sustain my lifestyle. <laughs> it's so unsettling, and even if you think you're, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But but unless you don't measure, you don't know how to manage, right? Course, so how yeah. will you reduce your footprint? It's only when you understand what your footprint is. Yeah. And so that's the final step. And uh, so at the end of this journey that we have taken in a three-hour class, mm. students have some idea about, you know, what needs to change, what is going well, and how can I exactly start having some positive impact on the world that, that I exist in as a sustainability professional. Yeah. And so while they don't have to complete the exercise within the class, they go back and this is... This is uh, 
um, an assignment that they have to complete uh, and, and they get a few weeks to do it. Mm. This is just kind of the beginning of, you know, introducing them step so, by yeah, step. The lesson is kind of walking them through it in yes. three hours. And then down the line, they're, they're completing it, maybe like seeing if, you know, what they set up as goals a few weeks prior are actually feasible. <laughs> yes, and then they get evaluated on it. So, right. so this is a weighted evaluation uh. that they need to complete and submit as their own sustainability and climate action plan. Wow, that's beautiful, Rajul. Thank you. Um, before we wrap up, I often like to ask faculty who come in to uh, have interviews here if there's something about them that maybe their students and their colleagues don't know that they would like to share. Do you have something you'd like to share? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, so for most educators, I think across the world and students as well, uh, when was the first time that they were introduced to online learning? Hmm. Most educators and students, the first time they were introduced to online learning, I mean, I think during the pandemic <laughs> would be, <laughs> the, at least most who I know. Yeah, exactly. And uh, no, for me, that was not the first time. So no. something fun and, and I'll say <laughs> equally surprising that uh, I can share with you is that I had my first brush with uh, online teaching uh, about 15 years ago. Really? Yes. And this I, I don't suppose Zoom was around <laughs> then or Microsoft Teams. No, it <laughs> wasn't. No. <laughs> yes. Um, and this was in India. So I was teaching for, for um, an organization that was dabbling with uh, WeSat technology that okay. was used. And mm. there was a software called Intervise Moderator. Mm. And so we as faculty would sit in one location in India. And we used to have these classes relayed to simultaneous locations in different parts of the world oh, okay. um, and, and different parts of India as well. So, so my first brush with online teaching was much ahead of the rest yeah. of the world. Um, and I think for me, what was not as challenging as, as for, for most educators when, when COVID hit and everything teach, uh, turned to online teaching was... I was just really comfortable doing you'd, it. <laughs> you've been there, <laughs> used to seeing yourself while you're mid-teach <laughs> in a little box. and uh... Exactly, yes. So, so I was like, I've been there, I've done that. I just need to make my classes more engaging. You know, that was where I was on. Yeah, yeah. Um, once you get comfortable with the yeah. technology and the clicking, then it's yes. about, okay, what's really possible here? Yeah, exactly. And was that program for, was that sort of accessibility reasons? So students who didn't have institutions near them or, or wish to study with, with your, yeah? Exactly. Okay. So so for accessibility reasons, because you don't have access to, to really that cutting edge kind of, uh, and, and just the front line of knowledge yeah. available in different parts. Yeah. Uh, so, so it used to be a lot of, uh, I'll say, residential uh, institutions where students were living in a certain part of India and they wanted specific, mm. uh, you know, segments of their education uh, and they didn't have educational resources so they could utilize that, that pool mm. that way. Well, you've heard it here first, folks. If you have any questions about <laughs> how to teach online, Rajul Singh within the School of Business is a seasoned pro. Um, thank you, Rajul. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for inviting me, Lauren. This oh, was I... just such a wonderful time, um, just going back memory lane, I think. Yeah, I've really enjoyed this conversation, and I will encourage listeners too, to to stay tuned, right? The School of Business, especially because, you know, Conestoga is a prime signatory, there's been a lot of great recognition lately, some awards on the recent SIP report. Um, so folks can look into that. And of course, if you feel that you're doing something sustainable within your program, or you want some further advice on maybe how to build this into your program, if you've taken stock of some of these sustainable development goals and thinking, oh, you know, this one is particularly relevant to this you know, area where I teach, um, there's a lot of support at Conestoga to, to figure out how best to do that and then... Um, yeah, to celebrate when we are. And and yes, so thank you, Rajul. I know people will get to know more and more about this because in large part um, due to your passion and all you bring to the institution. Thanks so, so much, thank Lauren. <laughs> well, we have come to the end of another episode of My Favorite Lesson, a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College. You can find all episodes in this series and more by following Teaching and Learning at Conestoga on YouTube. You can also find this podcast on Spotify and other places you get your podcasts. 
If you subscribe, you'll be notified each time a new episode becomes available. For 24-7 support for all things teaching and learning related, please check out our Faculty Learning Hub at tlconestoga.ca. I'm Dr. Lauren Spring, reminding you, as the great Bell Hooks once said, that the classroom, with all its limitations, remains a location of possibility. Until next time.